I'm Richard Belzer, and I'm speaking freely. So what this is all about is your right to freedom of speech. What made America great is an independent, vigorous press. If a jerk burns a flag, America is not threatened. Political speech is the heart of the First Amendment. We're expressing their religious beliefs. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all the God's children. Welcome to Speaking Freely, a weekly conversation about free speech in America. I'm Ken Paulson. Today we're joined by an actor and author, Richard Belzer. Great to have you here. Thank you. It's my pleasure. It's kind of tough to figure out how to describe you in two or three words because you've done just about everything. Excited about life, real, <laughs> daring. Um, well, I just, um, I unfortunately have done a lot of different things where I had to make a living. I've been a stand-up comic and a writer and a stock worker and a teacher and a I understand and you a actually, salesman. some of those paid better than others. Yes, obviously. I understand you actually started as a newspaper reporter? I was a newspaper reporter in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and I started out as all newspaper reporters start out um, doing obituaries. That was the first thing you did in a big city newspaper. And then eventually I got to cover uh, other things. And I remember my first stab at trying to be a real journalist. I covered, a, it was during the Vietnam War, and I went to the funeral of a local kid who had been killed in the war. And, I covered the funeral and went, and, and then I, I got back to my office and I started. I wrote, uh, "A cold wind blew on Bridgeport today as they buried." And I, you know, and so the editor said, "What are you, goddamn Ernest Hemingway? <laughs> well, who? What was his name? Where? You know, just it was like right. so. That was very unartistic." <laughs> <laughs> How long did you stay a reporter? Uh, let's see. I was a reporter for about three or four years, and I was a freelance writer, and then I started acting and then went into stand-up comedy and then started doing television. And I'm curious, as somebody who has voiced opinions now and then about the news media, what did you learn about the field of journalism as a reporter that maybe most other people don't see? About journalism? Yeah. Um, it's astounding to me how we go through these periods in journalism where there are brave, aggressive reporters who have these revelatory stories and do their research and and find the material. And then we go through these periods like now where uh, or I think it's more chilling now than it is perhaps uh, since uh, World War II in terms of the, the media not being aggressive about what's really happening for fear of uh, imperiling some national security agenda. And it's, it's so bizarrely naive and fitting the interests of the corporations that own the networks that. Um, it's chilling. I mean, during the Reagan years, I was censored. I, I, there were jobs I didn't get, and there were things that were canceled. And I was, you know, I wasn't vicious, but I was just um, had some anti-Reagan material in my act. And you, and you felt the backlash. I did, and uh, directly. Uh, and it was. And, uh, but you know what's what scares me uh, also? I'm a lot, obviously I'm scared these days. <laughs> is that s people take it upon the self-censorship is the most chilling thing to me. I think the networks are doing that now, and, and a lot of the mainstream press is just reticent to talk about a lot of things that are out there that are true. You know, like uh, after 9-11, the 27 members of the bin Laden family were picked up all over the United States and flown out of the country. I mean, why don't we hear more about that? Or, or Putin telling Dan Rather that the, the American establishment of the government had a sit-down dinner with him and told him exactly how they're going to carve up Iraq and who gets what oil. And, and so, I mean, th these are things I'm not making up. I mean, I wrote a book about conspiracy because people got tired of me uh, going on and on about it at dinner, so I just finally put it down. <laughs> well, we I, what I found, excuse me, sure. what I found is you don't have to make anything up. Well, I want to talk about that book. But first, let's go back to the bin Laden, the sure. 27 relatives, because I think it's a... My figures may be wrong. It's 24 or 27, but... but yeah, I've heard that sort of, you know, I don't know if it's urban legend. I've never read it in Time or Newsweek. Where did you get it from, and why well, are you so confident? See, this is what scares me, is that you're an intelligent guy. This is a great show. You're well-informed, and you think that might be an urban legend. That's how bad the mainstream press is, that you don't know that... That that's not true. And but how do you know? There it's are true? multiple sources. It was in the, the London Times. It was in the New York Times. Other people have written and spoken about it. It was in the Guardian. It was in. Um, it was also in the USA Today, I believe. A little. Some, you see, here's what I have Stone taught me, uh, and wh who I, and I was with Gore Vidal the other day, who also loves this quote. That I have Stone 
said it's all in the public domain. He read 10 newspapers a day. He, he read speeches. He looked at archives. I mean, you, you don't have to be a crazy conspiracy nut like me. I mean, I'm, a, I'm an actor. I have a lot of downtime. So <laughs> I read a lot, and I, you know, it drives me crazy. But it's a short drive in my case. But I mean, anyone out there, especially with the internet now, you can find, like, if you just type in what I said, the bin Laden family and them fleeing America, you'll find verifiable sources that are, you know, credible. So if that's what happened, what, why wouldn't a Time or Newsweek report that? Well, um, that, that's a good question. That's, again, the self-censorship. And do, does, do the American people want to know that George Bush Sr., for years, had a, since the 70s, had, was doing business with the bin Laden family? I mean, that is kind of known. That's not urban legend. That's reality. But it's being played down. And, and you know, I don't know why. I mean, is it that self-censorship? Is it... Uh, what are the, what I don't I really I'm I'm obviously speechless. <laughs> well, <laughs> most because it's a scary thing. And m many critics of the press say it's a uh, a leftist uh, uh, bias, but that's truly not the case, isn't it? It's, well, the, the press, the is, press left. is not left leaning. Well, Eric Altman just wrote a book called What Liberal Media. This is this when Bill Kristol and all these other uh, conservative spokespersons have admitted openly, occasionally on television or on the radio or in print, that that is a myth that they created and they laugh about saying, oh, it's a liberal media. Clearly, the media is not liberal. I mean, the five biggest voices in radio are borderline fascists. Uh, <laughs> really, I mean, I, I sue me. I, I don't care. Fascism. But sue you. That'd yeah, be uh, me. I sue me. It's fine. Not PBS. That's Richard Belzer speaking. And by the way, fascism was invented by Mussolini, as we know, and it means government for the corporation, the corporate state. So when I say fascist, it's... You know, not that this vicious. Is a, this is an educational program. <laughs> I don't mean I'm not patronizing. I'm just saying <laughs> I don't want people to misinterpret when I say fat. I I'm not just slinging it around. I mean it in the literal sense. But I think it's true that a lot of reporters are liberals. I mean, when you were a young reporter, I was oh. a young reporter. We had no money. Mm -hmm. um, there was a time in your life when you tilt at windmills, and you tend to be more liberal than conservative. But you're not in any real power. You yeah, I no agree. Bits. I agree. That there was a time in journalism where a lot of uh, liberal, so-called liberal people went into journalism. But today, the, the so-called liberals, like Dan Rather, if that, is that a liberal? Is Sam Donaldson a liberal? Are these liberals? I mean, that's astounding to me. As Michael Moore said the other night, you know, most of the people in America are way to the left of all, of all the Democratic candidates, because any time you take a poll, they want a better environment. They want... The, the, the desire for the death penalty is going down, and, and uh, you know, people want health care. They, they will help the indigent. So, you know, the fact that our present government has been hijacked by uh, several dozen white intellectual right-wing guys who, uh, you know, have grants. <laughs> so why aren't you concerned? Gets my gander up. Why aren't you concerned that this will affect your career? This, I mean, the Reagan remarks cost you. Uh, well, uh, you know what? Uh, at this point, um, I don't care. Uh, fortunately, because I, I, you know, I, I could flee to another country if I had to. <laughs> uh, because no, I've learned. I have. I've met in my life um, some people who have done some very brave, dangerous things. People who uh, were in the military, in government, or in various places. And I asked them that same question. And certain people, uh, if. if they don't bother because they're not worried about it. And like Michael said the other night, Michael Moore said that, you know, that someone asked them, how could you, you know, a corporation put out your movie and, you know, you're against corporations. These corporations are so smug and so patronizing to the American people that they think, yeah, let, you know, let them go out there. So they're still going to buy our products and be some nomulent and not really, you know, be aggressive about preserving their democracy or their individual freedom. So. I want to make sure we save some time to talk about uh, your book about UFOs, JFK, yes. and Elvis. Yes. But I want to loop back to the start of your career. You were part of the Groove Tube. Yes. Which was an amazing piece of work, really, for its time. You talk about the modern era of comedy, and a lot of people give credit to Saturday Night Live, or they'll mention Fridays. Or, right. But that preceded all of that, didn't it? Yeah, at the risk of being immodest, that was the granddaddy of, of these kinds of shows. And what it was, was me and uh, a couple of Chevy Chase was a part of the early days, too. We had, when video first became available. Remember the reel-to-reel -reel mm -hmm. video? Mm -hmm. My friend bought a camera. We just started doing, you know, filming bits and stuff. And uh, then we, we got a, we put together an actual show that played in a 90-seat theater in Manhattan 
off of 3rd Avenue, I think on 63rd Street. We went downstairs, and there were three television monitors in the front. It was like literally underground television. This was before cable. This is like 1970, 71. And we were doing satires of film and commercials. And, and uh, Lauren Michaels has said that's been an influence on him and Saturday Night Live and SCTV. And uh, it was pretty, uh, we didn't realize how um, daring we were. <laughs> what did you learn about the kind of comedy that needed to be made then? I mean, it, things had changed. It wasn't Milton Berle anymore. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, you know what, uh, the thing was, it's just that my personality is, of, I've always been very rebellious and very flexibly questioning things and making fun of them and imitating authority figures and, and seeing the absurdity from a very early age. And so it, it just, I guess this, I guess it was, the timing was right that the 60s were coming along and people were being more expressive and my personality just, it wasn't that I was an innovator or, or heroic, it was just that that was my personality and it luckily fit that period when there was, you know, rebellion and questioning and, you know, the, the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement. Of course, uh, a lot of people watching this show are familiar with your work as Detective John Munch. Mm -hmm. Uh, which has been a remarkable role in that it's used in series after series, a yes. Bridges series. Yes. And how did, how did you come into that role? This is a great story, if I may. Um, one day I was on the Howard Stern show, and it was an old friend of mine, and uh, Barry Levinson happened to be driving to his office, and they were casting this show called Homicide, Life on the Street, and uh, there were nine people in the ensemble, and the, everyone was cast with this character, Munch. They couldn't find... John Munch. So, and I wasn't even up for the part. I wasn't, I didn't audition for it. I, I didn't even, you know, know anything about it, actually. So Barry heard it and um, said, well, let's bring Richard in. Uh, so I went in and uh, I read for him and he uh, looked, he was, he was very surprised that I could, that I could act. It was like, which was, I guess, is a compliment and an insult at the same time, because <laughs> he was like looking at me during the, during the audition like, oh. So he said, all right, I want you to read the whole script and come back and, and you know, we'll, we'll do some more. So I couldn't leave the, the, the studio or the set, I mean, of the office, because they didn't want the script off the lot. Mm. So they said, go in this room and read it, and then we'll... we'll. So when we, I went in the room, I saw a stack of videotapes, and they said, munch, munch. So it was all other actors' auditions for the role. Wow. So, you know, like in Spy vs. Spy in Mad Magazine, I opened the door, I looked out, I closed it, and I started, I watched like 10 other actors <laughs> read for the part. And the thing that struck me was that none of them played it funny. They all played it like, you know, they're really intense and that over-the-top kind of cop thing, so, uh, which relieved me because I, I think the thing that Barry was intrigued about was I brought humor to it. And uh, to make a long story short, I did, th that show was, uh, uh, went seven years, and then when it was canceled, Dick, Dick Wolf, who does Law and Order, was looking for someone to take Benjamin Bratt's place. And I said to my manager, well, what if Belzer and Munch goes, you know, moves to New York and partners with Jerry Orbach? But they had already cast Jesse Martin. And then I heard they're doing this other show, Special Victims Unit. I said, what if <laughs> Munch is on that? So they called, and so the, the show had already been licensed, they had already been cast. But Dick Wolf liked the idea, and they worked it out with NBC and Barry Levinson and Tom Fontana and the guy that wrote the Homicide book and a French corporation that owned... I mean, it was the most astounding deal uh, how they made it, because the character had to go from one show to another. And So anyway, it worked out. And then Munch has since done uh, The Twilight Zone as Munch and uh, Beat, another show by Tom, the other Law and Order. Is there any precedent for that at all? No, I, I'm in the, the <coughs> Smithsonian. Yeah. No, it's the only dramatic character to be in five different shows. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, clearly they, they thought Munch brought something. Yeah, you know, I'm, a, I'm so flattered by it because if, uh, if, I were a, if I were a cop, I'd be very close to how he, I mean, it would be impossible for me, but because they allow him to be a dissident, they allow him to be a very opinionated and, and well-read and, uh, you know, a conspiracy theorist, and, but, but a good cop. And, so it's fun. You know, you raise the conspiracy theorist thing, uh, and that's some of your identification, public identification. So how much is Munch Belzer? Well, you know, it's very close. I mean, um, I try, the writers now know that there are certain subjects that I would love to talk about and, uh, and be truthful about, even if it's humorous. I mean, that to me has been my driving force, is that 
basically I'm an entertainer, so, you know, when I'm on stage, it, I don't want to be pedantic, but I do in a subversive way. You know, I've known your work since the Groove Tube, and I, there's a certain identity uh, when I think of your work, and yet when I talk to some other people, it's just immediately munch. This must uh -huh. have opened up an amazingly different audience for you, and, and, uh, to the point where there's people that don't know I was a stand-up comic, which I don't know if that's good or bad, but uh, that's why I'm going back on stage next month, actually. You've written a couple of books, and uh, one of which is How to Be a Stand-Up yes. Comic. Um, how, how, how do you become a stand-up comic? What advice do you give? Well, the book is, is uh, part satirical and part real information. And um, the only thing that I could say, if anyone wants to be a stand-up comic, is you have to be able to make strangers laugh, not you, just your friends and your family, which a lot of people are really good at. We all have funny relatives, but I've seen brilliantly funny people go on stage and just, you know, be mortified. It's, it's something that is, uh, you know, is a bit masochistic at first because you have to be prepared to fail, but if you think you're funny and you can speak in your own voice, then by all means inflict it on yourself, I would say. Any advice on what material to touch and what not to touch? Um, you're asking the wrong guy because uh, aside from the, you know, um, Nazis and, and pedophiles, I think there's nothing is off, out of bounds. Well, there's somebody, some commentator recently was saying, you know, of course I'm not doing a lot of jokes about the president. This is a great uh, time of national stress and, and there's war on terrorism. And what he was basically defining it, I thought, in a, almost a marketing way in that if it's, mm -hmm. a, if it's a joke that people won't laugh at, that's a bad product. And it's not in your interest as a comedian to tell that joke. Yeah, that's, you know, I understand that for survival, and it's very self-serving, but at, at the risk of being a modest, I, I did this bit about Reagan on Reaganomics that at first would get very, like, like sometimes a hiss and maybe a few, some laughs. And as time went on, I did the bit for years, I'm ashamed to say, because <laughs> if I write something good, I keep it. Um, I think of them as songs. I sing them over and over again. The bit got more and more laughs until the point where an HBO executive said, you got to, you know, do that. One of my first HBO specials, they made me do the Reagan bit. So it went from, so I'm not saying everybody has to be brave to be a comedian, but, you know, you could throw in something that may not get a laugh but will provoke some thought and couch it in re your real funny stuff. It's no, you know. And, and, of course, you don't have to have a unanimous vote on the joke either. If you... No, I, I, you know, a critic once said about me, Richard Bells is the only comedian I've ever seen who the audience leaves wondering if he liked them. <laughs> I'm proud of that. That's a, that's a great line. So we come to this book, UFOs, JFK, and Elvis. And Conspiracy, you don't have to be crazy to believe. That's right. <laughs> I love it. Um, and, and that's a heck of an image to have. I mean, you know, the, when you see references to you in print, it's, you know, conspiracy nut or... Right, right. Uh, that's something you embrace. I mean, clearly you do. You wrote the book to, that right. reinforces the image. Well, I wrote the book because, I, you know, the, first of all, the word not obviously, you know, is, is offensive to me, but uh, I'll take it. Um, I, you know, the thing that people in this country, for some reason, are, are allergic to the word conspiracy, but tell me something that isn't a conspiracy. For my philosophy is, I, I automatically, every, whatever it is, is a conspiracy until it's proven not to be. It's never the other way around. This country was a conspiracy. These guys got together and, and had a revolution. I mean, everything that you could think of, from Iran-Contra to Watergate to things that happened in early World War II, I mean, I, I don't have to go on and on, but you know what I mean. It's, sure. it's something about that word that has been demonized and marginalized uh, for, for whatever reason by, you know. To the extent that if, the, if there were indeed a conspiracy, it's, it would be hard to report it because people would laugh at you and you're... Yeah, you say conspiracy, you think people are saying, oh, there's, there are aliens on the grassy knoll and... Right. Well, what's the... Uh, <laughs> Which might be true. But. What's the first conspiracy that got your attention? Was it the JFK shooting? What first? Because I can remember... The first conspiracy. You know what? I have to admit that with the Kennedy assassination, I didn't really think about it at first as a conspiracy. And then um, some books about a year or so later some stuff started coming out that really blew my mind and then and then it kind of went away uh, because of the civil rights movement and Dr. King and all that and then when the Watergate break-in happened it was all the same people that were at the Bay of Pigs and involved in that and it was like that's when my brain just really uh, exploded and I was incredibly radicalized if I wasn't already and 
realize that there's a lot more going on here than, than we've ever imagined or being told. And that's when I started studying World War II and, and how we got to be where we are and, you know, what, what is America all about? The period after the JFK assassination, the Warren Commission, I can remember Mark Lane's books came out. Right. And, uh, and then there was an early movie called Executive Action, which... Yeah, which, you know, was a, was a kind of a faultly... It was not a good movie, but it was, it was interesting. And, and then there came layer. And, and at that point, you sort of... You were intrigued by the theories, but then came layer after layer after layer of yeah. author. Yeah. And then along comes uh, a movie like JFK. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your, wh which, which is somewhat fictionalized, but makes a lot of the same points. What's your take on that movie? To me, JFK is one of the most astounding events in cinema history, because outside of Birth of a Nation, I have never seen a film, and even more so in some ways than Birth of a Nation, this was a film that was vilified beyond belief before it was released. Scripts were stolen. Um, obvious, uh, there, are, there are journalists who who will work for the CIA, and I'm not making that up, I can prove that, who are in the mainstream press, and I'm not saying they're CIA agents, but they, they do take information from the government, and they do, they do the favors for the government. And uh, many of those people um, wrote these, most, these vicious things about Oliver Stone, whatever you think of Oliver Stone. Um, but to make a long story short, there's 80% of that movie is, pr is really on the money. He did make some stuff up, but, uh, you know, which perhaps he shouldn't have done, because the real information on this case which you know, I've studied for many years, is just astounding and more astounding than any fiction you could possibly imagine. You know, Oliver Stone was on this show and just listening to him talk about that period, it was like he was stunned that, that a movie could create that kind of upheaval. It, it was amazing and you know, people like George Will and other people, just the, the, the oral pornography that came out of their mouths and, and George Will actually said that anybody who believes there was a conspiracy in the John Kennedy murder is, is, is equal to a Holocaust denier. That to me is one of the most offensive things I've ever heard. What, what, are, what theory do you lean I toward? I well, I'm sorry. What theory do you lean toward? What do you well, believe Well, people say to me, okay, who killed JFK? My answer is, who didn't kill JFK? He was despised by the CIA. He was despised by the Pentagon. He was despised by the Cuban exiles. The oil billionaires detested him. Bank, the bankers loathed him. Here, let me, just to, I mean, I could obviously talk about this for the next five hours, but I'll give you my brief, because it's PBS and I, and I support you, and I'll keep it real short. Um, here's what I think happened, pretty much. Kennedy wanted to change the way America deals with money. He did not want to have a Federal Reserve. A Federal Reserve borrows from private banks, so we're constantly in debt, paying huge interest, to, so the country's literally owned by private banks. Kennedy wanted to print money through the Treasury and use the silver standard and not rely on the Federal Reserve. And he actually started printing money. I think it was something like 200 and whatever million dollars actually got printed. Now, if you think about that, if he does that, that costs tr private banks over time not billions of dollars, but trillions of dollars. And when you have that kind of money involved, hmm. your, your, your life's in peril. And, and I, I think that those interests along with the, with the oil interests and element, I'm not saying our government as an institution, but elements within the government conspired uh, to, they, they couldn't have it, they couldn't have it. He was, you know, he had Dr. King in the White House. He uh, was making peace with, um, with Khrushchev. He had a nuclear test ban treaty. He wanted to scatter the CIA into a thousand pieces. He didn't invade Cuba and give it back to the drug dealers and the, and the, and the gambling interests. Uh, he was skimming the oil depletion allowance, which was 1% from the top, which cost the Hunts and the Murchisons billions of dollars. So, uh, you know, he had a lot of enemies. And these details will be found in your book? They're in my book and they're anywhere. You don't need yeah. to, I mean, I, I didn't, didn't make any of that up. I'm curious. If I Honest. Go, if, <laughs> if I go in a bookstore, yeah. what section of the bookstore I look for? Um, to buy this book? Oh, that, that's a good question. In some places, it's in the comedy section, unfortunately. That's not and a good I'm, thing, is it? No. <laughs> uh, and in other places, it's in, uh, it was in current events, and they, it's been moved around. That's a good question. Um, unfortunately, on, it's, a lot, it's in comedy section. <laughs> a lot. But it is, there, it's, there, it, uh, you know, it, it, there's a lot of funny stuff in it. But. I need to ask you about Richard Pryor. There was a <laughs> remarkable salute to him at the Kennedy Center, and uh, your remarks were particularly compelling and memorable. Uh, clearly, 
Richard Pryor, Pryor played a pretty important role in your life. Um, Richard Pryor is the greatest stand-up comic uh, who ever lived or ever will live. He's like Michelangelo or, or Da Vinci. Uh, he defined the art form in, in a way that's beyond anybody's talent. And, and also, uh, on a personal note, when I first started the business, I was very political and very, uh, what we would say, dirty. Not dirty, but you know what I mean. And so I was, uh, I was not a favorite of people being, wanting me to be on television. And uh, I was going to audition for The Tonight Show. Finally, someone they convinced me, you know, you got to audition. And I went up and I cleaned up my act and I did this routine and I came off stage and Richard was in the audience and he said, who is that? And he got really angry at me because he found out I was auditioning for The Tonight Show and then I diluted who I was and I cleaned it up and, and uh, I mean, I've known him for many, many, many years and that to me was one, just one moment where uh, I realized that, you know, you, you just be who, you know, who you are. And, and he's been very supportive over the years, and uh, I wish him well. He's, he's, uh, he's, he's not feeling well these days, but he's in our prayers, and uh, he's just an artistic beacon beyond measure. So you took that advice to heart? Uh, yeah, uh, I did, and I did get on The Tonight Show, you know, after that, but uh, I did something that I didn't do that night that I felt didn't compromise who I was, so everybody won. It's been great visiting with oh, you it's, here. Oh, it's great, and it's a great show, and I'm, I'm pleased to be here. Thank you so much. Okay. Our guest today has been Richard Belser. Join us next week as we continue our discussion on free expression and the arts. For more information about Speaking Freely, visit our website at www.speakingfreely.org.